with with two short classes um, to do one lesson. In it. Um, but as long as we get through the the, uh, the introduction today, we will be fine. So we are going to pick up where we did last week and finish our comments on the introduction and get into the preface a little bit. Um, and then we should be in a good position next week to begin tackling the first commandment. So as we begin here, why don't we do so with prayer? Heavenly Father, be with us today as we come to you seeking your knowledge and your wisdom. Send your spirit to teach us that we may better know and understand your word and become ever more secure in our salvation through Christ. Bless this time we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is study two on the introduction. We talked a little bit last time about how catechism comes from the Greek word meaning to echo or sound back and forth. And we talked about why this is a good method for, for teaching. Because the word of God is changeless. The word of God, um, yeah, it doesn't change like like, like everything else does. And so the importance of having the answers provided for you and saying them back in the exact way that they're written uh, is a good teaching method to uh, reinforce, if you will, that, that changelessness of God's Word. Uh, we looked at this especially in connection then with Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, and really specifically verse 14, um, the reason for this, uh, the reason for wanting to be so grounded in the scriptures, and so the reason for the catechism, is that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. You know, we can look around and we can see many different denominations out there. You can see a lot of different guys on TV, hear a lot of different guys on the radio. And we need to be able to discern, you know, what they say, if it's truth or not. Um, I mentioned last time, you know, not that there's necessarily anything wrong with, with those guys on TV or those guys on the radio, but you have to be aware that the things that they say um, are not always going to be in line with Scripture. And so... We need to know scripture so well that we can discern, you know, hey, this is good, this isn't so much. All right. So, were there any any uh, questions on any of the introductory material then that we went over last time? Okay. Let's read this quote then from Luther's preface to the small catechism then. Um, we were talking, uh, Carmen and I, just a little bit. This is a very brief conversation. Why is one called the small and one called the large? One's bigger than the other. I think that's the only thing behind it. I don't know. Um, I don't know why he called one. That's probably just it. So, um, but, you know, they're very related. They cover the same material, but um, the small catechism is more for for children and their instruction. The large catechism is intended to, to be a, an aid and a help to those who teach the small catechism as well as those who have gone through the small catechism to get more information than from the large catechism. But, um, you know, at times as we go through the study, we'll look through some of the things that are said in the small catechism. And Luther's preface here certainly makes sense. Um, so this is from his preface to the small catechism. For young and simple people must be taught by uniform, settled texts and forms. Otherwise they become confused easily when the teacher today teaches them one way and in a year some other way, as if he wished to make improvements. But when you preach in the presence of learned and intelligent people, you may show your skill. You may present these parts in varied and intricate ways and give them as masterly um, as masterly turns as you are able, but with the young people, stick to one fixed permanent form and manner. 
I am probably guilty of, of this every now and then, of trying maybe to be a little bit too creative with the sermon text, hopefully not too often. But, uh, um, you know, sometimes you look at, I mean, I mean, you look at a text like today, you know, that everybody knows, and you think, oh, man, how am I going to preach on this text? And, you know, there's, there's a temptation to want to try to be, you know, super creative with it, and, you know, talk about it in a way that nobody's ever heard before. And, um, you know, you can do that to a degree when you have when you have people who are really grounded in Scripture. Um, so I probably could be creative pretty well with this group. Um, not too creative, don't worry. Um, but uh, there is there there is such value though in preaching once again those simple truths over and over again because they always have value. Um, they never they never grow old. I suppose we might grow weary sometimes of hearing the same thing over and over again, but we probably shouldn't. Um, you know, that truth of uh, that first telling of the gospel in Genesis 3.15, um, <coughs> wouldn't it be great if that was just as exciting to us today as it was to Adam and Eve back then? And it, and it ought to be. Um, especially we who can look back now and see how God unfolded that whole plan that was set in motion right there. So, uh, anyway, so remind me not to try to get too creative, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but, but there's value in going over these simple truths over and over again. The, uh, the need, of course, came from Luther's visitations of the congregations in Saxony. Um, this prompted him to put a lot of energy into developing his catechisms because he looked at the churches and this is his observation, which uh, Carlin commented to me on an email this week about the swine and such. That's such a lot of here. <laughs> um, the deplorable, miserable condition which I discovered lately when I too was a visitor has forced and urged me to prepare this catechism or Christian doctrine in this small, plain, simple form. Mercy, good God, what manifold misery I beheld. The common people have no knowledge whatever of Christian doctrine, and alas, many pastors are altogether incapable and incompetent to teach. Nevertheless, all maintain that they are Christians, yet they cannot recite either the Lord's Prayer or the Creed or the Ten Commandments, and they live like dumb brutes and irrational swine. Boy, Luther has quite a way of writing this. I think he would. <laughs> I think that was the point. <laughs> um, you know, if if the situation really was the fact that you know the children don't know God's word and some of the pastors don't know it and can't teach it, he ought to be direct into the point. It's a sad state of affairs. Yeah. I think we see that in churches today. Um, may it never be in our CLC that we see that, but um, in so many churches, doctrine is just not important. And so you get, and, and I don't want to, you know, I'm not here to pick on any one denomination or one particular guy, but you can see certain guys, again, on TV who preach a message, and at the end, you think, there was no Bible in this at all. Maybe he threw a message out there somewhere. And, and, and the danger of such a thing then, you know, with that, and this is off topic, but the danger with something like that too is that the message usually sounds something that's kind of good, kind of helpful, you know, that makes rational human sense, but it's not based, it, it, it has no basis in doctrine. Um, that's what Luther was concerned about. Um, not so much that situation, but that the church is based in doctrine because... Because if it's not, if it's not based in God's word, then what is it based on? Just whatever. Um, in Luther's day, it was based mostly on works, the works of the Catholic Church, of course. But um, you know, God's word should be the center of everything that we do. And so when Luther looked and he saw that God's word was not even known, he expresses his concerns. 
So Luther primarily kind of bl uh, puts the blame here for this lack of education on the pastors and teachers. Um, this is what he states in the small catechism. And his solution, then, is that the pastors be more diligent in teaching these basic truths. And so that's where the catechism comes from now. Um, and then once the small catechism is learned, then that's when Luther suggests to go on to the large catechism. And we talked about this last time. You know, everybody here has been through the small catechism, right, at some point or another. And so um, it's good for us to move on to there. We have this encouragement to, um, to teaching from Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 9. Um, this is Moses speaking. He says, And these words which I command to you today shall be, on, uh, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So the question here then is, how do Luther's plans for the catechism fit well with these words? Anyone? The teaching diligently. Yeah. That's the part of that. Yeah. Repetition. Repetition? Because because what's the goal? The goal is that you talk about them. Well, well, here's the repetition. Um, you know, you're talking about them when you sit down, when you walk, when you lie down, when you rise up. In other words, scripture is on your lips all the time. And shouldn't that be the way that it is? Shouldn't that be the way that it is in our Christian lives, where the scriptures are on our mind just all the time? And how does that happen? How does that happen when they're on our mind all the time? By that repetition, by going through Scripture over and over again. Um, and so, there's my encouragement for daily devotions. If you don't do them, you ought to do them. Get grounded in God's Word. Um, and don't just leave it for, you know, in the morning or just after supper either, like, like um, you know, we do at home. Um, have that Word in your mind, on your lips all the time. Um, <coughs> I like the imagery of uh, binding them on their hand. They should be as frontlets between your eyes. And um, when when the Jews came back from the Babylonian captivity, they actually started to take some of these things quite literally. And so, have you ever seen um, Jewish people today? They've got kind of that. There's that frontlet, very literally on their head. And that box is filled with, boy, now I can't remember what it's filled with. Probably something from the law. But maybe the Ten Commandments is in there. But anyway, this, this, is a, this is kind of a nice picture of, you know, this is, this is where the, God, the Word of God should be. Like right here, right before us all the time. But you know you have to take it down to music. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean... be good if that's all you did. Yeah. Well, his is a little too high, I think. <laughs> that is not quite as good as I think, though, one of those movies that came out, The Son of God or something, they showed a picture of the Jewish Pharisees or whatever, and theirs was more like... like yeah. Like, like all those in front of their eyes. Yeah, I, yeah, this is, this is a more modern picture. I think, yeah, they were more like that back in Jesus' day. So, yeah. But, uh, you know, that was kind of the problem, though, um, with with the Pharisees. You know, they took this kind of thing very literally like this, um, but uh, kind of didn't get back to the heart of this. Um, you know, the first part of this is, the words which I command you today shall be in your heart. But not just before you in an outward way. All right, so let's, li let's listen to Luther criticize the pastors who can't teach them. We have no small reason for constantly preaching the catechism and for both desiring and begging others to teach. <coughs> this, is, this is from the preface, by the way. 
Um, for sadly, we see that many pastors and preachers are very negligent in this matter and slight both their office and their teaching. Some neglect the catechism because of, of great and high art giving, uh, giving their minds as they imagine to much higher matters, but others neglect it from sheer laziness and care for their bellies. They take no other stand in this business than to act as pastors and preachers for their belly's sake. They have nothing to do but to spend and consume their wages as long as they live, just as they used to do under the papacy. Um, you know, the, uh, well, the life of a pastor is a luxurious life, let me tell you. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, you know all about it. <laughs> but, um, you know, really back in that day, um, you know, you could get dressed up in all your vestments as a Catholic priest and really kind of be something. Um, you instantly had people's respect. And, um, you know, part of Luther's criticism here is that that's all the people wanted was that outward respect to go through the motions of doing the sacraments and, um, you know, giving those out and hearing confessions and then getting the high praise for being the man of God in that place. Um, Today they wear a turner on collar. They do. You can find the full one still, you yeah. know, occasionally. Those are the really high church guys, but <laughs> yeah. Yep, today they just wear the turner on collar. Which, which wouldn't be wrong to wear, I suppose, but don't you dare. <laughs> I used to have one. Back in the day. <laughs> Alright, so it's wrong for me to wear one. That's fine. Um, so, so this is his criticism of pastors, though. Is that, um, you know, he sees as, as uh, you know, their highest calling. Um, well, you know, one of the highest things of their office is that office of teaching. And, um, they're neglecting that for, and caring only for themselves, their own bellies, their own, or maybe it's just out of sheer laziness. That's eh, a lot of work to put a Bible study together, so, yeah. Oh, but you lay people, he criticizes you too. <laughs> the common people also respect the gospel altogether too lightly, and we accomplish nothing special even though we work diligently. What then would be achieved if we were as negligent and lazy as we were under the papacy? So, I don't know, I think it was worse for the pastors, but still, he criticizes the lay people too for not having that respect for the gospel, taking it too lightly. Well, this time frame, is this after books are available? Yes. So, um, this is 15... 29, but these are both written in. And uh, I'm trying to think when Gutenberg's movable type. That would have been in place already in 1517 when the 95 Theses were first, you know, nailed to the castle door. Um, so this is sometime after that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is, um, this is 12 years after the beginning of the Reformation that these books are written. Was the Gutenberg about nine years before? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I couldn't remember exactly. Maybe wrong too. Well, I couldn't remember if he snuck in right at the end of the 15th century or if it was right at the beginning of the 16th. They were close to one another, but yeah, I don't know how close. But yeah, that's why like Luther's 95 Theses were were able to just spread like wildfire because you had movable type for the first time and could distribute these things in mass. Um, <coughs> And I think we talked about on that sheet last time that, um, you know, already just, what was it, six years, I think, after the, the catechism was printed, there were already 100,000 copies distributed. So, yeah, books are available to get out there. Um, and, yeah, so this is, a, this, this is 12 years after the start of the Reformation. And, you know, who he's criticizing mostly are Lutheran pastors here who aren't you know, teaching, who are kind of going back. That's, that's why he kind of says at the end of here, 
you know, being lazy just like we were under the papacy, because they weren't at that time. But basically he's saying, why bother leaving if you're just going <laughs> to, so. Do the same old, yeah, same old. Yeah, do the same old, same old, right? All right. So any thoughts on this? Otherwise we'll move forward to um, a couple of spots in the preface where Luther talks about the benefits then of studying the large catechism. Um, so if you've got your copy there, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flash some of this on the screen, but um, we're in the preface to the large catechism, paragraph 9. Um, so here are the benefits of studying the catechism. It says the Holy Spirit is present in such reading, repetition, and meditation. Um, that's from paragraph 9. And then catechism study is a most effective help against the devil, the world, the flesh, and all evil thoughts. Now, for this reason alone, you ought gladly to read, speak, think, and use these things, even if you had no other profit and fruit from them than driving away the devil and evil thoughts by doing so, for he cannot hear or endure God's word. Um, and then Luther goes on from there to describe how... Um, how this is so because it keeps our mind occupied basically on the things of God. So if your mind is on is is on the things of God all the time, then the devil doesn't have an opening to come in and, and tempt you there. So again, he's re-emphasizing this idea like we have from Deuteronomy chapter six of, of keeping the word of God in your heart, keeping it uh, going over it as you walk, as you sleep, as you go wherever you go. Um, keeping it before your hands and before your eyes, that kind of idea. Um, so the Holy Spirit's present, of course, in and through his word, and it keeps the devil away. Scripture day keeps the devil away. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, Colossians 3, 12 through 17, um, talks about... Uh, talks about some of this. Let's read through, um, and we'll point out, especially verse 16 here. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindnesses, or, sorry, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Um, so this list of all these things, okay, that, that, are, that are good things that we ought to do, how is this done? By letting, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing <coughs> one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word and deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So, you know, all of these, all of these kind of good works that that are listed here, um, they all have their basis in letting that Word of Christ dwell in us richly, in all of that wisdom and teaching um, and admonition that comes from it. So, any thoughts on any of that? So, the two reasons, then, the two main reasons that Luther has, then, um, for studying the Catechism keeps the devil away and it moves us toward godliness. And so, that really is, um, that's, that's the goal of what we want to do in this study, then. Um, keep the devil away and move toward godliness. Next time, then, we're going to start with the first commandment, and um, we're, going to, we're going to consider who is God. Um, so who is God? Who or what is my God? Many people today are asking these questions. Their answers, however, vary as men and women explore different religious traditions and forge their own blend of beliefs and practices. In the Catechism, Luther answers on the basis of Holy Scripture the fundamental question, 
who is my God? And so the catechism starts with, with the commandments as the commandments are so much a basis for all of the rest of Scripture, really. And, he's, and that first commandment um, that God starts it off, off with really defines, you know, who God is, why God deserves our honor. And so that's what we're going to look at next time. Um, I thought maybe we'd get just a little bit into this, but I think we'll stop here. The service was long, the Bible class is short. Yes, Kate? Can I ask a history question? A history question, yes, from our, from our history person. Uh, so the 95 Theses were nailed in 1517. At Correct. what point were there Lutheran churches and Lutheran pastors? And then a follow-up question, how did those Lutheran pastors get trained? And when did they start calling themselves Lutheran? Not that you know all the answers to that stuff. No, nope, sure don't. <laughs> um, you know, the first part is, when did they first start b being called Lutherans? Um... I don't know, pretty soon after, and it was a derogatory term at first. And Luther didn't want his followers called Lutherans. Well, so much for that. And so much for that. <laughs> We're not dropping the name. <laughs> um, but, uh, no, we're not dropping the name because, it, because it's, um, well, the reputation of the name has been tarnished by many other Lutherans, but... Um, it, uh, it should stand for what our true doctrine is. Um, I'll have to look into that. And as far as the training, um, you know, certainly most of the first pastors uh, would have been former priests right. who, who would have been trained, you know, in Catholic, well, in universities. And, you know, the whole world was Catholic, so the whole known world, anyway. Well, the whole Holy Roman Empire which was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire, but we won't get into that right now. Um, I will have to look that up as to when we first had Lutheran churches, but I can tell you it was kind of early on and it was a derogatory term at first. It intrigues me because there were all these Catholic churches and did those priests suddenly stop teaching Catholic teachings and teach Lutheran teachings and people still met there? Or You don't know, that's fine, you don't know, but... Or did they go somewhere else and meet in homes? Or was it like really sudden? Like, oh, yeah. October 31st, 1517, and then on November 1st, people did went to a different church? Or was it no, 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 it wasn't, it wasn't quite like that. I would um, think it would take a really long time for, the, for that even that message to get out, because common folk who were just following their priests. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll have to look into the history of that. Um, I'm not really clear on it. I mean, you've got, um, you know, the confessions of, of the Lutherans firmly established, you know, at Augsburg in 1530. Okay. Um, and what we have is the Augsburg Confession, um, but there were Lutherans, you know, obviously before that. Um, I was going to say something and now I don't remember. Yeah, they, they, they went through a colloquy process in which met, they met twice with the Board of Doctrine. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but Luther wasn't, wasn't, he wasn't really the first. Uh, Huss and whoever else was. Huss and, yeah, so, um, he was. yeah, so you've got these, these forerunners to, to um, the Reformation. You've got, like, John Wycliffe, John Huss, um, there were a few others. So, yeah, Luther wasn't the first one, but his was the first one that kind of stuck. And, I don't know, certainly, certainly Gutenberg's movable type was part of that because that word could get more quickly spread out to the masses. Um, Luther also had some guys that uh, really protected him. There were some... You know, Support from the... German royalty, even you know, basically. Right, which, which interestingly enough, is less about um, less about religion and more about politics. The uh, the Germans basically didn't think that the Holy Roman Emperor should have so much rule over his kingdom, and uh, 
So he wasn't willing to turn Luther over, and he protected him for more political reasons mm -hmm. than religious reasons. But, yeah, it might not be such a bad idea to go through that history. Um, we'll have to see how much time we have to do that, though. Um, it'll depend on whether we have Bible class over the summer or not, how much time we can spend on that. Because otherwise, we've got to move pretty fast to get through this by the time we get to Memorial Day. Was there a turnaround as a result of Karl Spott's iconoclasm when Luther came out of hiding and blasted him to kingdom come? Yeah. Anybody know what that's all about? <laughs> um, well, 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 the iconoclasts, they were what? The, um, they were all about uh, tearing down all the idols and, you know, um, yeah, well, yeah, they, they they wanted to take Luther's Reformation and make it more militant. Is that a good way to put it? Yeah. At least they wanted to clean house. They wanted to clean house, yeah. You know, much more, and and possibly as force if necessary. Yeah. We shouldn't do that. All right. Well, let's close with a blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.